Periscope. Hello, Periscope. And hello, Facebook. Prophet David Taylor here. It's the second Thursday of June. And on the second Thursday of every month, I do something called <clears throat> No More Genies. Uh, if you've been following me for a while, you know what No More Genies is. But if not, what No More Genies stands for, it stands for is that we're getting rid of our genie concept of God. Because I've discovered that there's a lot of teaching and a lot of ideas and a lot of everything out there where people have kind of believed in this magic concept of God. They've kind of believed in something where you just say the magic words or you just do whatever. And God has to answer the way you want, when you want, all those different kinds of things as if he was some kind of genie. <clears throat> and when you teach uh, the scriptures that way, when you give people that expectation, it completely negates the idea of a relationship. And that's why so many people don't understand God as a person. Okay, you have feelings because God has feelings and you're made in his image. You have a heart because God has a heart. You have eyes because God has eyes. We are actually made in his image. So that's why he tells us don't try to make him in ours. Don't try to come up with a graven image or something that we create and then call it God. And that's what we do with the genie concept of God. Another reason that the genie concept of God is so dangerous is because it takes away the idea that you have to do anything. That's why we like stories like Aladdin and, you know, we like anything where somebody finds a magic item or a magic totem or a magic genie and they get to, you know, rub the lamp or say the magic word or, you know, do the dance or do the hokey pokey and stick your left foot in or whatever. And then all this great stuff happens for you. That is really, really cool in fairy tales. That is really, really cool in, you know, fantasy stories. Nothing wrong with a good story. But that's not who God is, and that's not how the kingdom of heaven works. And so, uh, once again, I strongly encourage you. This is actually uh, No More Genies 24, so this is my fourth, so this is my two-year anniversary of doing this teaching on the second Thursday of every month. So there's actually 24 episodes. I strongly encourage you to go back to the beginning and watch the very first episode, because I go into detail about what No More Genies is and why I do it and why God put it on my heart. And how dangerous it is. You know, some people have lost their lives and some people have killed their children because of the genie concept of God. Some people have said that because God promised us healing in the Bible, that healing has to come a certain way. And so they said they were just going to pray. No medicine, no doctors, no hospitals. They were just going to pray. And the children died because they didn't understand God gives us divine healing. God also gives us medical doctors and nurses God gives us medicine. God gives us new, good nutrition from food in the ground. God gives us exercise. God gives us all those things. And because God is a person, God does not allow you to lock him into a certain way. God will always do what he said, but he always gives himself infinite freedom and creativity to do it in an infinite number of ways because that's how he glorifies himself. And so you are foolish if you think that you can lock God into a way of doing something and also time. What do I mean by that? For example, there's some people in the Bible that God healed where the Lord healed them like that. Some people in the Bible, like the woman with the issue of blood, actually pulled the healing, pulled the virtue out of Jesus by faith. Some people in the Bible got healed like the 10 lepers because the Lord told them to go wash and show themselves to the priests. And the Bible says very clearly that as they went, they were healed. And then some people got healed in the Bible, like the centurion's daughter who was sick, where the Lord spoke the word, and then it, they got back to the centurion that his daughter started being well. The Bible says she started to recover that self-same hour. See, so different ways. One blind man got healed because Jesus spit on the ground and made some mud out of the spit and the dirt and made some clay and put that as salve on the man's eyes. We've never seen the Lord do that before, and he never does it again in Scripture. I'm sure he did it again, but there's only one instance where we actually see him do it that way. So that's what I mean when I say that's how dangerous it is if you're walking around as a believer or as an unbeliever with this idea that God is a genie, that he's at your beck and call, that things have to happen. You can just pop your fingers and 
God's just going to do stuff when you say and how you say. And because, again, it, it completely destroys the idea of a relationship about you seeking his face and humbling yourself and asking him, OK, I know what your word says, but what is my component? So that's why I preach and teach no more genies. And like I said, this is the 24th episode. So I strongly encourage you to go back and watch it from the beginning so you can uh, hear because I lay a much more extensive foundation. What we're going to be talking about tonight is the last of the parables that I've gone through. Now, what I've been on for the last several episodes is I've been talking about what Jesus actually taught. Okay? What Jesus actually taught. What do I mean by that? We, when I say we, I mean Protestant Western Christians. Okay, American Westerners, Protestants. What we preach and teach is born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss hell, miss hell, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. Born again, get saved. Are you saved? Get saved. Miss hell, go to church, go to heaven when you die. That's what we preach, and we call that the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stop by to tell you that that is not the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. The Lord didn't preach born again, born again. Go to church, go to church. There's not one person where the Lord said, meet me at synagogue on Saturday, and I'll hook you up. The Lord always used personal pronouns. I am the way I, okay? But what the Lord actually preached was the kingdom. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. And I explained the difference between the phraseology of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. So go back and watch the video. So the Lord actually preached the kingdom. Okay, he preached the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. To help people understand how to operate and matriculate in the kingdom. That's what the Lord actually preached. And so I've been teaching these last several episodes on the parables that Jesus taught specifically about the kingdom to show people how the kingdom of God operates. Because it sure would be a shame for you to be a believer, to be born again, to be a Christian, and have no idea how the kingdom that you are a part of, how it operates. Do you know how I know that's true? Because we know how the world's kingdom operates. We know how the devil operates. We know how the world's kingdom operates. We know uh, according to how you look, according to your sexuality, according to your money, according to all the people you know, uh, sometimes big bar on stealing. Uh, it's all about sexiness. It's all about fame and what's hot right now. It's all about big eyes and little use, who's important, who's a celebrity, all that different kind of stuff. We know that. We know how the kingdom of the world operates. We're, we're dealing with it every day. That's not the way God's kingdom operates. Okay? The star in God's kingdom is Jesus. Okay? He is the great and the bright and the morning star. And any glory we have is a reflection of him. We're his images. It's not our glory. We don't take any glory for ourselves. And none of what we do do we do according to our own strength, but rather according to his grace and his word. It's completely different. Okay? And so that's why some people get results in the kingdom of heaven and some people don't. Some people get what God has for them in this life and some Christians don't. Okay? The difference is not God <laughs> because God is no respecter of person and because God never changes. He never changes, nor does his word. The difference is not him. The difference is that some believers know how to operate in God's kingdom and they actually have a relationship with the Lord. Some believers do not know how to operate in God's kingdom, and so they never get everything they're supposed to have in this life. So I've been laboring in the word to talk about what Jesus actually talked about, his actual message, not the one that we preach, born again, get saved, miss hell, go to church, go to heaven when you die. Not that one, because that's not what the Lord preached. He preached the kingdom. So tonight I'm dealing with the last parable in the series, and we're going to be dealing with the parable of the talents. So let me say a word of prayer, and we're going to dive right in. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for this night. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness, for your mercy, Lord. I just love you. I just bless you. I just thank you for this opportunity to serve you, oh God. I thank you for your mighty word and your mighty spirit. 
I ask you, God, to be in the midst of this broadcast tonight. Oh, God, I surrender. Take over my tongue, my hands, my eyes, my words, everything. Oh, God, breathe through me and let uh, what is spoken be what you want spoken to the glorification of your name and your kingdom and that the saints of God might be edified and learn more about you so we can operate the way you want us to operate now in this time. And I thank you for it and I believe it for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, our scripture reference for tonight is Matthew 25. So let's go to Matthew 25 and we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 30. Matthew is the first book in what we call the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not actually the New Testament. <laughs> Everything that Jesus did, he actually did it under the Old Testament. The New Testament does not actually start until Jesus dies. So the New Testament starts when the Lord is on the cross and the earthquake hit and uh, the blood moon hit and, and saints that had been dead got up out the grave and the veil in the temple was written to, rent, torn in two. That's actually when the New Testament started because the Testament doesn't kick in until the death of the testator. So if you write out a last will and Testament, it doesn't kick in until you die. So the New Testament actually happens at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when the Lord dies. That's actually the beginning of the New Testament. And then the Old Testament has a variety of different kinds of books. It has history, it has the beginning of the world, it has genealogy, it has uh, encapsulated adventures uh, of certain protagonists, like that's what the B Book of Ruth is, um, nonfiction. Um, it has poetry, it has a lot of music, that's what most of the Psalms are. It has wisdom, it has major prophets, it has minor prophets. So the Old Testament is full of different types of literature and writings. The New Testament, after the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the New Testament is primarily, primarily letters, most of whom were written by Paul, but the New Testament is letters, okay, written by Paul, Apostle Paul, Apostle John, Apostle Peter. Now, some people say that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews some people say that Luke wrote the book of Hebrews, and some people say that Apollos wrote the book of Hebrews, but it's still a letter. The New Testament spends the vast majority of its time explaining itself. So the Lord comes to bring us the kingdom in what we call the Gospels, and then he dies and kicks off the New Testament. And then right after the Gospel of John, we go into Romans. And everything from Romans to the book of Revelation is pretty much the New Testament explaining itself. And then we get into the book of Revelation, which deals, which deals with the end times. Okay? Just so you kind of understand how the King James Bible is laid out. It's not all the same type of thing in each book or in each testament. So remember from now on, whenever you read anything about the Lord, when he was alive and walked the earth as a man, that's still the Old Testament. That's still the Mosaic Law. That's still the, gov the covenant that God made with Israel through Abraham and Moses. That's what the Lord operated under. And then he died to kick in the New Testament, just so you know, okay? Matthew, who wrote the book of Matthew, was one of Jesus' followers. He was a former tax collector and probably nobody liked him because the tax collectors of the day would add a percentage on top of the Roman tax. So if the Romans required 10%, the tax collectors would add extra 15 or they would actually add extra five for a total of 15, then they would pocket the extra five themselves, okay? That's who wrote <laughs> the first book, Matthew, and that's who we're going to be reading tonight. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV, the New International Version. Again, it will be like, when he says it, he means the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. 
The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. The ma his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. <laughs> So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Holy cow. Okay. There's so much in those verses. Uh, we're going to dive in. Obviously, I'm not going to have time to exegete everything tonight, but these verses are incredible. They're just incredible. Now, remember the context under which I'm speaking. The Lord is saying, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is how my kingdom works. Okay. The first thing I want to say is that this parable is often return, uh, referred to as the parable of talents. I stop by to tell you, you've heard people talk about anything that God gives you counts. That's true. But this particular scripture is talking about money. Okay, it's very specifically talking about money. The par parable of talents, they're talking about talents of gold or talents of silver. It's talking about a weight of gold, a weight of precious metal that's worth a certain amount. It's talking about money. Okay, just so you know, because I've heard people, you know, when God gives you music and God gives you the gift of gab and God gives you athletic and God, you know, those are all talents. That's true. But this parable is talking about money. Okay, just to be clear. Okay, so look at 2514 again. When the Lord says again, it's because he's giving yet another example of what his kingdom is like. It's like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So that means God in this life is going to give us resources to manage. I'm talking about money, okay? He says, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Stop. So what I want to point out here is that you need to stop looking at other people and their level of finances because the Bible just told you God is going to trust you according to your ability. What God is looking for is for you to be faithful with what he gives you. And a lot of people are struggling because they keep trying to say, well, I need more or this or what about this person? Or what about this person being on, on whatever financial level? But the Bible says, what is your ability? What can you handle? What can you handle? It also tells you that God is not going to give every one of his servants the same amount of wealth to manage. That's very significant because I know if, you, if you're if you over the age of 10, I know you've heard somebody preach about how God wants us all rich and God wants this and God wants that. Well, that's relative. Rich is relative. Okay. that What level of money is rich? Okay. Rich is, is very, very relative. And so if you're used to making $20,000 a year, and you come from a country where most people make $20,000 a year and you get bumped up to making $100,000 a year. As far as you're concerned and as far as the people around you, that would probably be considered rich. Okay? If you come here to America and you make six figures, okay, for a lot of people in the corporate world, those are starter salaries. Because people in America, they're, you know, it's, it's a small amount of people, but there's some people that make, you know, obscene amounts of money. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to stop comparing 
what God gives others with what God gives you, because that is not what God is concerned about. And I'll explain that more as we go through the parable, but that's not what God is concerned about, the amount. That's what people are concerned about, okay? Because people think that your worth or your value or whatever it is, is uh, dependent on your salary and your job. That's true in the kingdom of the world. It's very, very true with worldly people. That's not true in God's kingdom, okay? The Lord called fishermen, he called tax collectors, he called social revolutionaries. Apostle Paul was a tent maker. Uh, the Lord's stepdad, Joseph, was a carpenter. Okay, so these are the people he entrusted his kingdom to. So it's not a matter of worth in God's kingdom. It doesn't work that way. And if you feel good about yourself, you understand that concept. If you like you, you understand that. But if you don't like you, you might have got caught up in that worldly trap of thinking that it's what you do and what you have and all those things that determines your worth, and that's not true in God's kingdom. But the flip side of that is you need to stop comparing what God trusts some people with. Stop feeling like if your ministry isn't a big name or you're not on TV or you're not traveling all over the world because all of the people that are, very few of them started out that way. Very few, most of them started very, very small. Didn't nobody know who they were and the Lord lifted them up, okay? So each man according to his ability, that's the key there. And not everybody got the same amount of money. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. Stop. What did the Bible just tell you? <clears throat> Verse 16. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. What principles are, is that talking about? It's talking about diligence. That's talking about work ethic. That's talking about understanding investing, understanding how to take what God has put in your hands in terms of money and multiply it, making that money work for you, okay? And he said that man who received five bags of gold went at once. He went at once and put that money to work. He put his money to work, put his money to work put his money to work. Did you know that you're not supposed to work for money? Did you know that money's supposed to work for you? Do you know that if you spend your life chasing a paycheck, you might not have a lot to show when it's all said and done, if you spent your life working for money? Money is actually supposed to work for you. And people that have higher levels of wealth, money works for them. Did you know that? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it more, but it's a mindset. The Bible here is here. That's why I keep telling you, it's important you understand what the Lord actually taught, because it's talking about money. It's a mindset. What do you do with money when it drops in your hand? Do you do anything to make that money multiply? Do you have any type of interest-bearing accounts? Uh, the stock market is crazy right now, but, you know, there, there's obviously a lot of checking and saving and money market accounts that are still paying you know, point, point 15, point and a quarter, point and a half in some places, CDs, whatever. Do you have anything where your money's working and it's generating interest, it's generating more, more money? Do you even think that way? Or are you the paid on Friday, broke on Monday <laughs> kind of thing? Get that check in your hand on Friday. By the time Monday roll around, that money gone. The Bible is trying to show you here that it's a mindset. The man that got five bags of gold. Now, Bishop Jakes called that the instinct to increase. And I like that. I really like that whole series by Bishop Jakes. That man with five bags of gold, the Bible says he went at once immediately because he thought, how can I make this money work? How can I take this five, five bags that I have and turn them into five more? He did that <clears throat> through investments because the Bible said he put his money to work. Can you see that? The man that got two, bowl, two bags of gold did the same thing. He went and put the money in the murk. And the man who got the one bag of gold went off, dug a hole in the ground, and just stuck that bag of money in the hole in the ground. Okay? What I also want to point out here before we go to the next verses is, is not what you get, is what you do with what you get. And that has everything to do with your mindset. With your mindset. That's why some people know how to make a dollar out of 15 cents. 
Mm -hmm. If you had a good mom, if you had a good grandma, your grandmother knew how to take 15 cents and get a dollar's worth of stuff out of it. Because that's entirely possible. Learning how to stretch a dollar till it holler. Okay? That's here. What do I mean? I mean things like coupons. Do you know what, short, what stores you regularly shop at? When do they have their sales? Do you know what a sale price is? <clears throat> to know what a sale price is, that means you have to shop regularly, but you also have to know how much you normally pay for an item. So whatever they charge for that item in all the other stores, where is there a store that's charging the lowest amount? Where is the sale price? And how do you know the difference? Because many times stores put stuff out and they say it's a sale price, and it's not a sale price. It's a regular price. They just put a sticker on it. You have to know how much things cost on the normal, on the regular, to know a sale price when you see it. Sometimes they offer two for one, but sometimes they jack the price up and, you know, whatever. That kind of thing. Do you think that way? <clears throat> how many groceries could you get for $25? If somebody put $25 in your hand, what kind of groceries could you come back home with? Could you come back with enough to feed yourself, feed your family, whatever? That's what I mean, stuff like that. That's a mindset. That's a skill set, being able to know how to do that. And the Bible says very, very clearly that the first two men know how to put that money to work. Okay, they knew how to put that money to work. But the last man did not. He took it and he buried it. Okay, verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Stop. The Bible just told you that even if it takes a long time, eventually God is going to call you into account for the money he's trusted you with. I discovered that a lot of believers don't know that. A lot of believers don't know that whatever it is you do for a living, however it is that you generate your income, or if you have multiple income streams, eventually God is going to call you into the account for what he's trusted you with. And let me just say here as a side note, because it's not in this parable, that's why we pay tithes, and that's why we give offerings, and that's why we do alms. Because for every dollar we get, we're supposed to take a dime right off the top and give it back to the house of God to make sure that the word of God is available on earth. Okay, so that there is meat in his house, because God knows the most precious thing he's given us to live off of is his word, because we can't live by meat or bread or food alone physical food. We have to have the word of God. Our physical food feeds our bodies, but spiritual food feeds our spirits. Spiritual food is going to come through preaching, teaching, and prophesying like I'm doing now. And so God says, you take a dime out of every dollar I bless you with, and you put it back in my house so that my servants can continue to bring you your spiritual food. Because what happens? See, in America, we're spoiled. Even when not being able to go to church, we can still get online. And we can still have access to preaching, teaching, and prophesying because we're spoiled in America. But what would happen if there was no word of God? Oh, Lord. What would happen if there, if there were, were no prophets or there was no prophetic word? And you searched and searched and searched and searched and you couldn't find anybody with a word from the Lord. What if there was no preaching? What if you Sunday morning were still not really gathering in churches again? What if you couldn't go online? What if nobody was broadcasting? What if there was no word from the Lord to start off your week? What if there was no teaching? What if there was no one to break down the word of God for you? You see that? That's our spiritual food. That's why we pay tithes, give offerings, and then alms are things that you do for the poor. People that are poor, you give them food, clothes, shelter, water, and the Lord even takes that personally and promises you a reward if you do that. So don't ever listen to anybody that tells you that God doesn't care about money. That just is headache inducing. I don't know where Christians got that from. I have an idea, though. Uh, the idea, you know, because because a lot of our theology was taught by slave owners, by people that were holding people as property and trying to exploit them for slave labor and all that. So that's where a lot of these ridiculous Christian ideas came from was really bad theology. Because the Lord just said, this is what my kingdom is like. And he's talking about this extended parable about money. So don't ever let anybody tell you that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, the son of the true and living God, the Alpha and Omega, 
the first and the last, the firstborn from the dead. Don't ever let anybody tell you that Jesus or the Bible doesn't deal with money, that God doesn't care about money, that blah, blah, that's not true. It's not true. So the Lord says, the Lord continues on, God is going to call you into account for all the money he's put in your hand and what you did with it. <clears throat> Verse 20, the man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. So the Lord said, what you did was good and you did it through faithfulness and you are faithful. In other words, the Lord is saying, I could count on you. That's why I trusted you with the five bags of gold because I knew that you would give me increase. You would give me return on my investment. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. In the King James, it says, enter into the joy of your Lord. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Stop. I want you to notice that the Lord said the same thing to both of those first two brothers. Did you notice that the Lord did not make a difference in his response based on the amount of money that he gave them? That's what I meant when I said God is not as much worried about the amounts as he is about you being a good and faithful servant, about you giving some, giving some return producing some interest, producing some increase, because he said the same thing. He did not reward the man that had five bags of gold more than the man with two bags of gold. He said the same thing. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. He said the exact same thing. Do you see that? So the point, the point, my brothers and my sisters, the point is to be faithful with what God gives you. The point is to have the mindset to take, I'm going to take whatever money God puts into my hand and I'm going to turn it into more. If God puts a dollar in my hand, I'm going to turn it into $2. If God puts $10 in my hand, I'm going to turn it into $20. If God puts $50 in my hand, I'm going to turn it into $100. If you do that, the amount is not the issue. The fact that you brought the Lord back increase for his investment is because he said the same thing. He said the same thing. But now we're going to look at this last brother. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Then the man who had received one bag of gold, uh, Master, he said, the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. Oh, my goodness. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. I told you this talking about money. This parable is talking about money. OK, so he said, you are a hard man harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your golden ground. See, here is what belongs to you. What exactly does that mean? You can interpret it in more than one way, but part of what that means is that the Lord knows that his kingdom is ever increasing and of his kingdom, there is no end. God can plant something over here and reap a harvest over there. And sometimes he lets us in on that too. Sometimes people that have lived and died were sowing in their generation and then another generation reached that harvest because that's the power of the word of God and that's the power of the seed of God. Okay? So that's why sometimes people get confused because remember, the Lord basically, when he walked the earth as a man, stayed in the Jerusalem, Galilee area. But what he did changed all of time and all of eternity and infected, uh, affected the entire earth. When the Lord died, the entire sky got dark. The moon was bloodshot. The earth was quaking. Okay, he died in Jerusalem. But the whole world was affected. That's the power of the word of God. So sometimes God can plant in one area and reap a harvest somewhere else. And sometimes you have experienced that. 
Sometimes you showed kindness and you showed love and you showed faithfulness and you didn't get it back from the people that you gave it to. But then God brought somebody else in your life and God brought back to you all of that kindness and love and faithfulness that you sowed somewhere else. Can you see that? That happens all the time as believers. And that's another reason I want to say to never believe that the Lord doesn't see what you're doing. You might not reap your harvest from where you think you're going to reap it. You might not reap your harvest from who you think you're going to reap it from. But you will reap a harvest, okay? Because sometimes you can plant here, but it comes back from other places. So the wicked lazy servant said, well, I knew you were like that, and I got afraid. So I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. And the Lord said, wicked, lazy servant, stop. God told you that it's wicked to take the money he gives you and you don't do nothing with it. Oh my goodness. God said, you are lazy if you take that money and you just bury it somewhere and you don't even try to get any kind of increase. And so many times, this is what many Christians, I'm not talking about unbelievers now, I'm talking about many Christians, to understand that they are operating in a wicked and a lazy spirit. They're not even trying to give God increase. You're not even trying. I've heard, I'm not going to call no names. I've heard so-called believers say, God understands I don't make enough money to tithe. Fail. You have failed. <laughs> okay? You have failed. And I'm... I could go into detail. I'm not going to go into detail about who actually I heard say that. But she said, the Lord knows I don't make enough money to tie. Fail. Whatever money you have coming in, you take 10% off the top. And as you continue to sow, you will continue to get increase. Okay? But when you tell God, well, you know, I don't have enough and I can't do so and I can't do that, the Lord responds by saying, you are wicked and lazy. You took the money I did trust you with. Why do you think the Lord only gave that man one bag of gold? <laughs> you took the money I did give you and you just put it in the ground. You didn't do nothing with it. And I want you to notice that because anybody that manages money knows that many times money has to keep moving because markets don't, markets don't always respond the same way at the same time. Like, for example, the stock market right now is in turmoil. OK, and many people that didn't move their money out of the stock market in time have lost hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions, maybe even tens of millions, because if the market crashes, if your stock gets devalued, you can go from whatever level of money you have and all that money can be erased like that. Not so much with savings accounts and money market accounts and checking accounts or CDs, not as high of a return of rate of interest, but based on how you have it set up, no loss of principal. You see that? But a lot of Christians don't even try. They just take the money that God gives them and they just bury it. They just sit on it. They don't do nothing with it. God says that's wicked and lazy. And God says, you know that I'm expecting a harvest in many places. Let me give you some practical ideas of what that might look like. There's these little booklets called tracks, T-A-R-C-T-S, tracks. They used to be really big many, many years ago. I still use them sometimes when I do street ministry because I always like them. And I read a tract, and uh, that's what, uh, when I chose to get saved when I was 9 or 10 years old, because I read a tract about standing for God, before God in judgment and going to hell. And I'm like, I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> okay? But a tract is a tool that you can use, that you can hand somebody when you do street ministry. You might not ever see that person again. If that person reads that tract, and they get convicted, the Spirit of God moves upon their heart, and they get saved. Don't you know that their soul being born again is added to your account? And when you stand before God in judgment, the Lord will show you that because of you sharing how to get saved through that tract, that person came into the kingdom. They came to know Jesus. And then what if that person shares that tract with someone else? And on and on and on. That's how you reap where you know, things that you never see or, or, and many times, especially when you're in prophetic ministry, you prophesy to people that you are never going to see again. Sometimes you've got one shot. It's not like pastoring. 
when you're pastoring and you have a congregation, normally, you know, you have your regular crowd, you have your Easter crowd, you have your Christmas crowd, but normally you have a core amount of people that you see, at least on a weekly basis. But when you prophesy, sometimes you're going to never see the people. Sometimes you encounter the people one time in your life. But when the Spirit of God comes through your mouth and the Spirit of God speaks the word to them, it can completely change their lives. And what if they go and they operate in the power of that word and they do things for other people? That's what I mean. That God's word can reap a harvest where he hasn't sown. And it will be people that you never personally meet and people that you never personally see. Yet, you've been a blessing to them. That's why God says, if you ain't doing nothing with the money I've given you, not paying no tithes, not paying no offerings, not at least putting in, he said, you should at least have put it in the bank to get a deposit and, and get a deposit account so it could be earning interest. The Lord said, you at least should have done that. What does that mean? That means the Lord is ex expecting a return on the money he trusts you with. He's expecting something, even if it's just a point, a point, 15, a point and a quarter. He's expecting something on the money he gives you. And the Lord said, if you're not even trying to do that, you are wicked and lazy. The Lord said, at a bare minimum, at a bare min minimum, you should have opened a savings account, a checking account, or a money marketing account, or a C an interest-bearing CD. And if you weren't going to uh, try to invest it, then you could at least put it in a bank and I would have got some interest, the Lord said, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. That tells me that the Lord is expecting an increase on the money he trusts you with. And remember the context the Lord is saying, this is what my kingdom is like. So now you ought to be able to see how much, so many Christians are missing it. When they're saying things like, God knows I don't make enough money to tithe, wrong. You tithe off of whatever money you have. You study investing, you study money, you learn how to increase, how to make your money turn over. I did a teaching on 30, 60, 100 fold about what that actually means. That's actually in my No More Genie series, uh, 30, 60, 100 fold, what, what that really means in the Bible, because a lot of people have taught that in a really crazy way too. But once again, God is expecting a return on his money. So don't be listening to people tell you that God doesn't care about money. And don't be listening to people that tell you that you don't have to actively manage your money. Yes, you do. Because the Lord is expecting an increase on what he gives you. At a bare minimum, he's expecting interest that you can get out of a, uh, a deposit account at a bank. Right there in the Bible. Okay? Now, let's see what happens to that brother. Because if it happened to him, it can happen to you. This is a parable. Verse 28. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, Lord, have mercy. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. So the Lord is going to reward those that multiply his money with even more money. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Stop. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means a mentality. It's the difference what the Lord just told you. <laughs> is that there's a difference between an abundance mentality and a scarcity mentality. You hear people confess whichever one they have all the time. All the time. What do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. One of the, the plainest examples I can give you is people when they say they can't find a relationship or they can't find anyone to marry or they can't find... You live on a planet of seven and a half billion people. And you're trying to tell me that ain't none of them people good enough for you. You can't find one person you think you can build a life with. You got the wrong attitude. You got the wrong mentality. God didn't give you, uh, you're on a planet of 7.5 billion. That billion would it be. Okay? Your mentality is wrong. Okay? 
And so when you have uh, an attitude of faith and abundance, you realize that no matter what your circumstances, God can always give the increase. God can make it rain in a desert. God can make water come out of a rock. God can make manna fall from heaven. God can make quail come from the sea. That's bread, water, and meat. <laughs> God turned the wilderness into a grocery store for the children of Israel. When you have an abundance mentality, you know that the Lord took uh, two fish and five loaves of bread, blessed it and break it and multiplied it enough to feed. There's two separate food miracles. There's one miracle, which is the miracle of the 4,000, and there's another miracle, which is the miracle of the 5,000. I discovered a lot of people don't know that the Lord did that twice. He took the, the loaves and the fish, a very small amount of food, and blessed it and break it and fed 4,000 men plus the women and children. So if every man is married, that's 8,000 people. And if every uh, couple has a child, that's 12,000 people. He did that. And then he did the miracle of the 5,000, that's 5,000 men. If every man had a wife, that's 10,000 people. If every husband and wife had a child, that's 15,000 miles that the Lord fed with uh, two fish and five barley loaves. You understand? Because the Lord has abundance and he has an abundance mentality. And that's an attitude of faith that God can take your pennies and turn them into millions. God can give you a multi-million dollar idea. That's what a lot of people don't realize. A lot of people prayed and asked God for money and God answered you with ideas. He answered you with multi-million dollar ideas. And you have to go through the, the work and the effort of becoming an entrepreneur and turning your ideas into actual income and turning it into gold. Uh, everybody knows that Steve Jobs and Wozniak started Apple in their garage and that man worked. Now he did work himself into an early grave. He should have learned balance, but that man worked seven days a week. So did Bill Gates. When Bill Gates was establishing Microsoft, he worked seven days a week. Okay, Diane Warren, the most successful living songwriter uh, in the US, Diane Warren works 12 hours a day, six to seven hours a day. That's why she's got so many songs all over the place. Do you see that? That is being diligent and faithful and hardworking. That's a good work ethic. All that is up here, as opposed to being wicked and lazy and looking at what you have and always talking about how it's not enough and I can't do this and I can't do that, so I'm just gonna sit down. See that? So the Lord says that he's gonna take <laughs> the money he gave you and give it to somebody that has an abundance mentality somebody that did the work, somebody that wasn't wicked, wasn't lazy, but actually did the work, made the investment, and take, took the money they had and turned it into something more. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them because you're wicked and lazy. You didn't do nothing with what God gave you. He's not going to give you more. He's going to take away what you had. Okay? Then he says, and throw that worthless, oh, throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, that last part is a whole nother, I've talked about it before, but it's a whole nother teaching. That's not talking about hell, okay? There's a lot of people that say that that is talking about hell. That's not talking about hell, okay? And you say, well, how do you know it's not talking about hell? The Lord has used that language before, okay? The Lord has used that kind of phraseology before. He's not talking about hell. Uh, and if you've never heard this kind of teaching before, it might be new to you. It might be, it might be, well, obviously, if you've never heard it, it would be new. But what I mean is, is that maybe you've never heard the breakdown uh, like I'm about to break it down. Okay. <clears throat> there are uh, four words in the Bible that are translated to the English word hell. There's Hades, Sheol. Tartarus and Gehenna. Hades and Sheol both basically mean the same thing. They mean the underworld. They mean the place under the earth where departed spirits go. Because once your spirit leaves your body, you need a physical body to walk around on the earth. So once you die, your spirit steps out of your body, your body goes back to the dust. But your spirit goes into the underworld. Okay? Uh, until the Lord made the way to go to heaven, but that's just for believers. Um, if you go before God and you get judged and you're still a sinner, you're going to get cast out. But Sheol and Hades mean the underworld. It's where the spirits 
that have departed the earth live. Okay? Gehenna is actually a Greek play on a Hebrew word that means burning garbage dump. It's where we get our basic concept of hell from because it's a garbage dump and many times they would light the garbage on fire. That's what that word Gehenna means in Greek, but it's a play on a Hebrew word that means garbage dump or burning garbage dump. Then the word Tartarus is only used once in the New Testament. That's 1 Peter 3, 6. Tartarus is talking about the part of the underworld where the fallen angels are chained. Obviously, all of the angels aren't chained down there because some of the angels became demons and they're on earth with the devil because the devil's not in hell, the devil's on earth. But there are some of those angels that fell, that followed Lucifer and got kicked out of heaven that are actually chained in the underworld in a place called Tartarus. That's the only place in the Bible that uses that word. So all the things that we keep seeing as an English word translated as hell are actually different words in the Hebrew and the Greek. Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus. Not one of those words is used when the Lord uses that phrase, outer darkness. Outer is exoteron, which means outmost, outer, external. And darkness is skotos, darkness either physical or moral from the basis of skia, shadiness or obscurity, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What that means is that in the kingdom of heaven, there are different levels of glory. Those that are close to Jesus get to bask in and walk in the full level of glory that the Lord, that the Lord has. But there will be those Christians who did not walk with the Lord in this life, and so you're not going to be close to them in the next life. And being far away from Jesus in the kingdom is like being in outer darkness. Because one of the translations there is obscurity. It means you won't really be of note in his kingdom because Abraham is of note. Moses is of note. He has a name. King David is of note. Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter. We know these people. Sarah, Esther, Ruth. We know these people. James. Okay, we know these people. Apostle John. We know these people because God gave them a name. Mother Mary, Jesus' mom, we know these people. There's going to be a lot of Christians who are going to end up in obscurity in God's kingdom because they did not obey the Lord in this life. That's not talking about hell. It means being so far away from the Lord's glory, it's like you're in darkness. And I know some of y'all have never heard that before because what a lot of Christians wonder about is what happens to the Christians that they're born again, they're saved, but they don't really live for Christ. That's what happens. If the Lord has set up mansions and houses in his kingdom and he's in one of them, there won't be wicked, lazy Christians in there with him. It'll be good and faithful Christians in that with him. And the wicked, lazy Christians will be cast out of that house and you'll be so far away from the Lord's glory, it's going to be obscurity. It's going to be like darkness. That's not talking about hell. You see that? Not one of the words for hell is mentioned. Okay? Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus is not in that verse. It's not talking about hell. It's talking about being so far away from Christ, it's like you're in darkness because you don't get to be up close to the Lord and enter into his joy because you weren't faithful with what he gave you charge over. That's what happens to believers that are born again. They accepted him as Savior but they never accepted him as Lord. You got saved, and then you just did what you wanted to do. See that? The Lord said that's what his kingdom is like. So I start by to encourage all of those of you that love the Lord and all of those of you that are faithful to the Lord to keep on being faithful because God will reward you both in this life and the life to come. Do not worry about Christians that are not faithful to the Lord because I know we spend a lot of time looking at what other people are doing. That is just seems to be a part of who we are as people. We spend a lot of time worrying about what other people are doing. If other people are not being faithful to Christ, you do not have to worry about them because how they're going to end up at some point, the Lord is going to call them to, into account. And if they haven't been faithful with the money that God gave them, then God is going to tell them that they're wicked and lazy and he's going to cast them away in the outer darkness. They're going to be so far away from the Lord they're going to be in shadiness and obscurity. And the people that have been good and faithful with Christ will get to enjoy his full glory and his joy and his happiness. I know some of y'all have never heard that before, but that's what that's talking about. Okay? 
So yeah, so that's why you hear me say all the time to be faithful in what God gives you. That's all you have to worry about. Stay on track, stay focused, whatever God put in your hand, do that and do that with the faithfulness and he'll reward you both in this life and the life to come. Okay. All right. That's it. So that concludes my teaching on the parables of Jesus. Like I said, this is, uh, let me see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12. So my last 12 No More Genies have been about the parables of the kingdom of heaven, what the Lord actually taught. So when I come on next month, I'll be on a different topic unless the Holy Spirit you know, tells me to revisit this. But uh, go and check those out. And uh, you can hear the full set of teaching, okay? Now, if you have new prayer requests, put them on the screen right now. Let me see if there's anything you want me to pray for. When you see me close my eyes and speak in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost if there's any more prophetic words or anything else he wants me to release. So I'm going to do that now. Okay, all right, didn't really get anything, so I got it all clear there. So uh, now, you know, uh, obviously I don't do this for money. I do this because, you know, God called me to do it. But if you do want to sow into my ministry, there's a couple ways to give. You can give through the, your Zelle app. My email is prophetdavidtaylor at gmail.com. You can give through uh, your cash app. My uh, uh, handle ID is dollar sign DMT2. DMT and then two capital I's, not the number two DMT, then two capital I's. If you want to sow into my ministry and bless me, where that money goes is helping me to expand my ministry. I have my uh, prophetic uh, third quarter prophetic devotional going to drop next month. Uh, you know, obviously it costs money to put those books together. I have some uh, compilation teachings that I'm working on. Uh, I'm working on my Meet in My House project where I told you where we're going to prophesy to homeless people. And then I have some other things I can't tell you about yet. I'm working on my music every week, but it's going to help expand my ministry so I can get the word of God out to as many people as possible. Okay. I also want to call your attention to my 150 hymns project. I love that project. I'm so excited about my 150 hymns. I'm writing a fresh hymn for every song. Um, and so I've released some so far on New Music Friday, but I have a whole separate Facebook page set up for those hymns. Okay. And I'm getting some live singers and it's going to be great. You can buy the sheet music. It's perfect for Sunday morning worship or choral teaching, or you can use them in school or, you know, they're new hymns. Uh, I grew up on hymns. I love hymns, but these are fresh hymns based on every psalm in the Bible. Okay. So I've got a lot going on. So that's where any offerings you give me is going to help me expand my ministry. So I want to thank you so much. Thank you to all of you that are watching me live on Periscope. Thank you to all of you that watch me live on Facebook. All of you that are listening to this on the podcast, uh, God bless you so much. And remember, remember, remember that the Lord wants us to be faithful with the money he gives us and give him an increase, give him a harvest. When the Lord calls us into account with the money he's put into our hands, he wants us to have an increase to show. And God says that is good and faithful. We don't want to be like that brother who just sat on that money and didn't do anything with it. And God calls him wicked and lazy. And then God said, we're going to take the money we gave him and give it to the one that knew how to multiply it. Mm. And he's going to get cast out and going to be far away from Jesus. That ought to tell you, you don't have to worry about people that are not faithful. Don't worry about people that aren't tithing or giving offerings or giving alms. Do not worry about Christians that are not obeying God with their money. The day is going to come where God is going to call them to the accounting and judge them accordingly. He just told us that in that parable that we read, okay? So I want to encourage those, those of you that are faithful to continue being faithful, all right? God bless. Have a good night. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. I will be back Sunday at my regular time at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Amen. God bless you. Have a great night, and I will talk to you Sunday.